Man, what's up, everybody? It's, it's your boy, BQ. This is your final resolution review. And it's like a week late. And I know I've done some like really late reviews in the past. But this fucking StreamYard website, folks. I haven't heard anyone complaining else complain about this. I could not, over the last several days, get this freaking website to load. Uh, I think I mentioned on my last upload that I did, I was struggling with it up to that point. Then all of a sudden I got to load, was able to do something. I've been trying to do this final re resolution review for a minute. So my damn cat here to fuck with shit. You go away. You go. Um, so we're going to get into this and, and I'm going to try to do it fairly quickly. These, these type of reviews can be a little bit difficult because there's no... There's no backstage shit where we're kind of advancing storylines and stuff. We're just watching wrestling matches for the most part. So um, I'm going to get into it. My thoughts of uh, final resolution. Uh, I'm recording this Friday morning on the eve of the Chargers losing by a thousand points on Thursday night football. It's been a rough week for me sports wise. I had to sit through the Lakers win the in season tournament. My least favorite team in the world. Chargers losing my least favorite football team in the world, the Raiders. Um, what else? The Angels, we lost Shohei Otani to my least favorite fucking baseball team, the Dodgers. Uh, and and most, a lot of you guys know, like, I'm a serious fantasy sports player. I'm usually up, like, 600 bucks this point of the month. I am down 200. The only positive thing for me in the world of sports right now is that my WNBA team, the Indiana Fever, got the number one overall pick for a chance at a generational talent and Caitlin Clark. So that is the only positive thing going on for me in the sports world right now. So we're going to disconnect from that and, um, you know, get into this final resolution show. Impact announced that they re-signed Eddie Edwards. Awesome. Uh, I, I, I don't think he had any other options, but at the same time, you don't want to let Eddie Edwards go. Like he is, he is one of the faces of the company. I think there's opportunity for him to really excel in the company, but I think it also takes a little more self-discipline on his end. I think it takes a little more character development on his end. You know, I think Alicia is doing really good work with him right now, but Eddie has this way of just being stagnant and stale. Like he'll, he'll, We'll wait forever for something new and he'll kind of give it to us. And then it just like flatlines for the longest time. And then, you know what I'm saying? So um, there, there's sky's the limit for what he can do with this company, but it's, you know, a little stagnant right now, but I wouldn't let Eddie go by any stretch. Like he's, he's one of those dudes um, in a company that I think really lost its identity as it became impact wrestling, got away from TNA. You know, he's one of the people that gives it uh, its identity. So uh, Kushida was the, all, the other signing. I'm not the world's biggest Japanese wrestling fan, but I've, I've kind of enjoyed Kushida because he, is, he has a little bit of a character to him, as opposed to some of these guys that come in and do the strong style. Strong style they're just chopping each other. Uh, you know, he, he's a little bit different. I believe he's still signed in New Japan, though. I believe that's the company he works for. Um, so it's much like in AEW, there's Takeshita, who is still signed to DDT Pro, but he's exclusive to AEW in the States. So this is more what kind of deal this is for Kushida. He says he's exclusive to Impact in the United States, but that doesn't mean he's not um, signed elsewhere overseas. So we'll get into Trend 7 when that when that time comes. And uh, my notes didn't save for this damn pay-per-view, so I'm going to kind of read the results uh, off WrestleZone and then kind of um, hopefully remember kind of shit that I wrote down. So let's get into this final resolution, folks. Uh, I think we're good to go with StreamYard now. So hopefully I can do a quick review of this Hidden, gem, hidden Gems, aka before the Impact Super Show episode uh, tomorrow. So uh, this kicked off with a pre-show, PCO versus Jesse V. I, I couldn't care less about this match. Um, this was just uh, something to get. They did a lot with the Canadian wrestlers and stuff to get them, you know, on screen and, and, and in the ring and in front of these people and, and get the people engaged and, and having a good time. But speaking of that, before I even get into this, 
I, I did watch the IPWF show. They did a lot better this time around than the past. I still think it's bad. I still would air it on Thanksgiving and not do it a Thanksgiving Day episode. I would just keep it. Here's my one silly episode, and let's get back to business. But um, they did a better job. I kind of miss Josh Matthews on commentary, but I don't miss silly Josh Matthews. You know, like at first I was kind of, oh, this is a breath of fresh air. But then, you know, that was my big knock on him towards the end was just telling bad jokes and stuff a lot. Um, and that, you know, that was on brand with this episode. But I thought Alex Shelley sounded okay on commentary. The promos weren't like, like the first episode they ever did of this, the promos wouldn't end. It was just, they wouldn't stop. And the matches weren't fun. The crowd was sitting on their hands. Like they, they're actually, the crowd was actually engaged this time around. So it made it easier to watch. I still think it's, it's bad. And I think the wrestlers have more fun than the fans, but uh, they did a better job. You know, so if they want to make it a, tra- a tradition, cool. I would make it the Thanksgiving Day episode, though, and, and cut ties on anything else that's silly. Uh, the final resolution, let's get back to it. Uh, good show. The matches for me were a little long. I, I, there was a couple that wouldn't end, uh, but I thought in general, even the matches that should have been quick were kind of long. And I've, I've maintained that these shows should be two-hour shows. And if you don't want to do two hours because you're charging people to come in for a pay-per-view, then two and a half hours, you know? But I really think three hours, three hours plus is way too long for these things. Uh, but getting back to this PCO versus Jesse V, really, really couldn't care less. Uh, PCO wins. Um, and then we get... <laughs> So I noticed this episode. So, so we've been writing Tom Hannafin on, on Twitter pretty good about first time ever. And I, I think he's going to chill on that. I, I'm confident at this point. He didn't even do it once during this show. But the new thing is one-on-one. So when him and uh, Ray Wall run down the matches, the cards, every single one-on-one matchup, they go going one-on-one. Like they don't change the the terminology at all. And I was I was kind of laughing because – he probably said one on one three times in the show up to this point, including about 10 seconds before Jake something shows up on screen. Say tonight I go one on one with Jason Hotch. I was like, OK, this is the new phrase um, for impact. But anyway, uh, he cut a promo on Jason Hotch. Jason Hotch attacked him from behind with a chair. Jake's something. I think we all like him. But he. uh he comes in, he wrestles, looks good, and then disappears for large chunks of the time on television. That could be something in his personal life. It could be something creatively. You know, um, we like him, but he kind of strikes me as a, a difficult guy to write creative for. Not him, like his personality, but I mean, just here's a big, strong wrestling dude with kind of a generic name. Like, where do we go with him? So it kind of strikes me like they don't have much for him but again i think we all we all like him so uh you know nice little promo about going one-on-one one match i enjoyed quite a bit in the pre-show was aiden prince versus jack price and i really think in these monthly shows that they should do more to get jack price on screen to get um, jason hotch on screen to get fucking shogun my God, Shogun has been signed to this company. We're going on four years in March. We've seen him on TV maybe four times. Like I think he's still setting up the ring, paying his dues, you know. But I just don't understand why. And Jack Price, we rarely see as well. He's got the best theme song in the company for the show. But I don't understand why for these shows, but really it's not a lot of people are watching them. I just don't see why they don't get more run. When they were doing BTI, they like they weren't even wrestling on BTI hardly, you know. Like throw these people out there, my God, like it's crazy. But but this was kind of enjoyable. Aiden Prince uh, is, to my knowledge, because Lewis Carlin knows him, and the website says this much. But I believe he is signed to Impact. But right when he got signed, he got injured. So this was kind. Of, I think this was his return match, or damn near close to it. Uh, and he can. Um, He's not going to win the X Division Championship or anything like that, but I think he can be a good good cog in the machine for the X Division. 
I fully expected him to win here. And this was Jack Price's first win in Impact. Uh, I like his finisher, the, the lung blower. He had, I think he had a, a different name for it, but we'll see what happens, man. I, I thought that with Sheldon Jean and Kenny King that why not throw Jack Price in there as well? I thought, you know, that could have worked the way he, the little I've seen of him, the way he kind of carried himself and all that. I, was like, I think it works, you know, but um, I don't know. Maybe it'll team him up here with Sheldon Jean uh, going forward because we're losing Kenny King and, you know, they're trying to get Jack Price on TV now. So um, it's one of my cats over there on cue making noise. Just can't help themselves. So Jack Price surprisingly got the win, but I, I enjoyed this um, quite a bit. Then uh, real big pre-show. My God, Sheldon Jean versus Frankie Kazarian. Uh, obviously, Frankie Kazarian wins this match. Sheldon Jean is another dude, really talented, man. And now that they have – we didn't get to where it could have went with Kenny King. They could have really done something as a tag team. They, like, they really had him as a lackey, and I'm sure there was a plan to – somewhat elevate them as a as a tandem or get him some wins but then kenny king's like hey i'm out what's sheldon gene do now so now all eyes on him you know he doesn't have a team partner he doesn't have someone he's following around so it you know he's gonna have to uh really step it up step up at this point and he could be uh, you know another another cog in the exhibition machine so nice little pre-show I could have done without the PCO match. I could do with without any PCO match, to be honest. I know he's really over with the audience, and I I could just do without PCO personally. I, w I was actually excited that he didn't resign, but um, he's back. So, you know, let's do it. Impact World Tag Team Championship, ABC versus Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers. This was also uh, pretty good, mainly mainly for me, for Eddie and Brian Myers. I appreciated that they were both wearing green. They were like dressed like a tag team. I'm sure Brian Myers, as a New York guy, didn't really like wearing Celtic colors, but, you know, why not? This was – people on social media talk about this being a really random card, and this was. I mean, Eddie, uh, the undefeated team of Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers, right, because they've never teamed up before, uh, but they just get a – title win title match just hey here here we go and that's some of the complaints I've, I've had about these monthly specials for for a couple of years now is that they just feel the need to put all the titles on the line and it's not necessary alex shelley didn't defend the title tonight you know i would have rather the abc just put him in a six-man tag with somebody and give brian eddie and brian myers a partner i mean if you're going to be random be random but don't be random with shit that just makes no sense whatsoever. You know, does that make sense to you? So title shots where we're just, hey, this person, this team, this person, they've done nothing. They don't beat anybody. Like, here's the title shot. Like, I would just rather random, let's find a, a reason for this to have a, to, for these fuckers to have a six man tag match. You know, like, I just don't want title matches that mean nothing. But, um, this was okay overall. Uh, I just, I just not really like much of an ABC fan, you know. I mean, I'm just, I, I say this all the time. Just though, like the Bullet Club in general, I'm not a fan of. And Bullet Club has lost so much fucking steam as a faction, but they're still kind of cool. But now they've kind of branded themselves as this a, as this ABC, and it's almost like you forget they're part of the Bullet Club. So it's like, I, I feel like they have moved down a tier once they became the ABC. Once they were like, hey, we're no love, don't call us Bull Club anymore. ABC. I, I just think they lost lost a, a tier. They moved down. So, yeah, good, sh good shit, good shit. But uh, after the match, the Rascals attacked the ABC. So, we're going to get this rematch, it looks like, at um, Hard to Kill. And right now, Hard to Kill is not grabbing us. You know, they... They're pushing hard to, hard to kill and snake eyes over the big four the big four combined matches, and they do look good on paper. But it's um, there's just something missing for hard to kill. Like they're not, you know, we know that the TNA rebrand is coming, but they're not like pulling us in quite yet. And I don't think this helps. Uh, Rascals versus ABC. That they probably get, I would imagine there's going to be a stipulation this time around because 
feel like we've seen this match 50 times. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we've seen it twice. Maybe we've seen it once. I don't know. I feel like we've seen it non-fucking-stop. And then uh, Alexander and Zach, Josh Alexander, Zach Saber Jr. cut a promo backstage. And Josh Alexander, it's the same shit every time with these promos. Like they have to, they have a really, ch- a real challenge ahead of them in 2024. Like he's going to get his win back versus Will Ospreay. We know that. Um, but they have a really, really big challenge ahead of them because they've never had to, to push and book Josh Alexander, the single star, without being in a title picture, whether it was the X Division Championship or the uh, World Championship. And even before that, he was a, you know, part of the North and they were tag team champions forever. Like they've never had to, they haven't had that crutch. They haven't had, they've had the two crutches, the wife and the belt. And the injury, you know, the injury, even even in a third one. Like now, what are we going to do with Josh Alexander in 2024 to make him relevant but not bore us to death and not insert himself in the world title picture immediately? You know what I mean? So he's probably – Moose is going to win and hard to kill. Obviously, him and Josh are going to collide, probably slam adversary. Hopefully not before that. But they've got a really – a real big challenge on their hands, I think, with him. Uh, and I thought Zack Sabre Jr. sounded good here. Then they go back to the the ring, and Alicia is yelling. Um, by the way, I want to say the show looked okay. They kind of had a fish lens type of view on the ring, which I thought I thought was okay. I thought that was cool. But Alicia is just unnecessarily on the microphone at this point, saying it's her time and and. I don't even know what she was going to say. Like it was just a bunch of yelling and and whatever. Uh, Santino comes out, just so happens to have Jody Threat and wrestling gear ready to go with her music queued up. And we get an impromptu match. Even though I like Alicia Edwards, this this went on too long. We knew how it was gonna end. Like there was no quick matches here. I, I just felt like everything on this show was just was just long. Even the matches that were used to being shorter were long. And it's good for Alicia to get a little ring time. I think when she has a time to, to show what she can do instead of like jobbing really quickly, I think that she looks all right. But Jody Threat hits this F5, and it was probably the best it's ever looked because it's always looked very sloppy. Like Rosemary with the Red Wedding did a lot better job. Like it's, it doesn't look good when Jody Threat does it. I don't understand what they're doing with Jody Thread. I don't have a clue. I thought it was a kind of an unnecessary signing because I didn't see how she fit into the uh, overall landscape of the knockout division, and I still don't. She's she's becoming Kane, you know. Like we need someone to come out for a surprise opponent. She's becoming Tommy Dreamer, you know. Um, I just uh, you know she's she's cut a couple of promos. Her acting's really bad, so I I don't. I don't know what they're trying to do. This was trying to get Jody Threat into the in front of the Canadian audience. That's what it was. Hey, Alicia, go up, go out there and ramble for a couple minutes so we can get Jody Threat on the card. So for for what it was, it was fine. A little long for my taste. Also a little long for my taste. Uh, Tommy Dreamer versus Diener. Uh, did not care about this. You're just not going to get me to care about a Tommy Dreamer match at this point. I don't even want him to retire. People were like, "Hey, retire." I, I, I've never said that. I've never said get him off my screen to where he never wrestles again. I've said get him off my screen because I don't want him holding championships. I don't want him in the main event. I don't want him as a surprise opponent, a surprise tag partner. You know, but he does add something to the show. Championship, it's not working. Get rid of it in 2024. Do not come with a fucking TNA digital media championship belt. Like this is your golden opportunity to drop this joke title and to come with a television title that means something and people want. You feel me? So I don't know. Tommy Dreamer, you know, they kind of brought up him beating Crazy Steve by disqualification, but they don't. They're not painting much of a picture. They're not telling much of a story. It's kind of, I'm sure we're going to get that rematch at Hard to Kill. And at this point, if 
does anyone want to see that? Like the, the hard to kill card just is not shaping up. Any any match on hard to kill with Tommy Dreamer defending this title is not going to be fun. They had him on the Mexico show, which even though I don't like flipping and diving a whole lot, I don't mind Mexican wrestling because it all contextually it all makes sense. Like it's it's one thing to have luchadors in a in a American ring that I'm not like feeling so much, but if I'm actually watching Mexican wrestling, it it's the it it works for me. I can I'm I can dig it. But they had the so the Mexico show was okay, but they had Tommy Dreamer on there and give the Dreamer driver through a black Taurus through a table. Why? That is one of the most popular wrestlers on the fucking roster. Even if he's in, maybe he's not even on the roster anymore at this point. He's doing a ROH today. So who even knows? But I mean, my God, he was still one of the more popular people with the fans over the years that he was part of Decay and even when he wasn't. And he's a baby face and you had time, you know, push, push dreamer, get, you know, make sure dreamer looks strong. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't care about this. I think these two had a feud at one point. It just shows, shows how much I care about what both of these wrestlers are doing right now. And they've had, they have to find, you know, I'm speaking of challenges. They have to find something for Diener to get interesting again in 2024 because just him and Khan is not it that 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 is not it and then the rascals cut a promo backstage because we were supposed to get Trey Miguel versus Speedball Mike Bailey which you know I think they've wrestled a couple times we knew that was going to be really really good but they're cutting a promo on attacking ABC Santino interrupts just so happens to have a mystery partner uh queued up in his wrestling gear um and we get the rascals versus Mike Bailey and Trent Seven. So I didn't watch anything of Trent Seven's in NXT, the whole mustache mount thing. So it's just, I don't care about NXT, NXT UK. I don't, I have no interest in any of that. I've seen him wrestle. He did one or two AEW matches when I was watching AEW. And, um, you know, he's popular in the UK. So I can dig it. You know, he's probably not going to be my favorite wrestler. You know, he's kind of old, kind of fat, but it it kind of works for his look. You know what I mean? Uh, he's probably not going to be my favorite wrestler, but, you know, if he's popular with the fans, he's popular with uh, the UK fans and all that, then, you know, let's fucking go. Like, uh, you know, let's go. I, and I think it was a good – I mean, it's becoming, it's becoming a tradition to do these in-ring signings, and they're phony as – phony as a $3 bill. Uh, these contracts, you know what I mean? But um, it's become a, tra- a tradition a little bit around this time of the year. And even though they've kind of shit the bed a couple times, AC Romero, Larry D, uh, they haven't other times, Mike Bailey, Josh Alexander. So it's becoming kind of a tradition that is good for the brand of TNA. And, uh, you know, this was a good one here. This was more in the, um, in the lines of a Josh Alexander or Mike Bailey than, than, uh, you know, the triple XL guys, even though I like those guys, but I mean, it, it was like, um, we didn't even know who they were when they were signed, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, but this, this was, uh, a fun match here at first, you know, Mike Bailey comes down. Sometimes he has the headband on, on, and I think he looks ridiculous and he wears it, didn't wear it to the ring. It was like, awesome. And then the match starts and he's wearing the headband. So, Okay. But this match is exactly what you expected it to be. And, of course, you know, Trent Seven and uh, Mike Bailey win. Of course, uh, Tom Hannafin refers to him as Seven because uh, that's his last name. But uh, we knew that these two were going to win once they put this um, match together. So, uh, cool. Uh, we'll see what Trent Seven does. I don't know what kind of feuds they put him in with Impact. Um, I don't know if he... Kind of continues a team with Mike Bailey. That's a possibility, but people seem to be excited with it. I, I like the graphic that they put out. Like Trent Seven signs with TNA, Kashida signs with TNA. You know, they, these are nice looking graphics. They have color contrast. Um, it's right now kind of becoming the so and so is all elite. You know, we're getting every couple of days that this person signs with TNA, this person re-signs with TNA. 
they're starting to do a little bit better now over the past week or so with with just creating some chatter online i don't know who their international superstar is they're bringing back uh because i think they're announcing it today i know they said by kingo yesterday but i don't believe it's him because i think it's someone else today but i've been asking for this kind of stuff on social media hey we're making an announcement tomorrow if it were me and it's not i would be tweeting out and uh, facebook and same with instagram tune into youtube tomorrow at this time now you get you bounce all your traffic from three platforms to one the one that you can monetize and the way youtube works the more views you get in the first hour the better the, the video is going to do overall so when people are waiting on a certain video and you can bounce them from three platforms uh, maybe even four i think they have like a TikTok and shit too i don't know um that's how i would do it and you and you can monetize it and it can spread you know so when i'm always talking about better leveraging social media better leveraging youtube like this is the kind of shit i'm talking about when i've been talking about marketing since day one this is the type of shit i'm talking about instead of just being so reliant on twitter which is actually the platform that has the it potentially has the biggest reach but in general has the the smallest reach um then we finally got jake hotch i mean uh, jake hotch jason hotch versus jake something uh you know they were teasing that jake something was not even going to come out i don't know that the the live audience even knew what happened do they do they see that backstage you know jason hotch taking him out i, I don't really know but jason hotch came out and cut the john schuyler promo you know to where um he would, hey, shut up, Penzer, and all that. He did a pretty good job, uh, but much like with John Schuyler, there's not much of a reaction. Uh, and I, I kind of like the good hands, but they're struggling to connect with the crowd, I think, a little bit because I think they go for the cheap, in, cheap indie heat instead of really portraying themselves as heels that we want to boot. But Jake something comes out and something i've always wondered is that you know i pay so much attention to penzer's uh ring announcing he, it's oh it's just always like and his opponent jake something there's never like he's he hails from here he weighs this nothing they they every single entrance for him is just jake something and that's it it kind of goes back to what i was saying at the beginning when you're trying to find something for him to do because you're painting him as a very generic wrestler even the ring entrance like having a good ring entrance a good ring introduction like this is all part of the presentation of a wrestler and ultimately helps with their branding and uh, they just paint him as so generic you know what i mean but this is a story that i don't even know if it the people in the arena knew i think jake came down injured and they're like okay you know and uh you know jake i believe jake is pretty popular in that part of the country as well uh but yeah, this this was okay. Jake something wins, obviously, with Into the Void. You know, there's no uh, no doubt about who's winning this match. This was one of the very first matches they announced for res final resolution, to where people were like, okay, what the we were just doing random shit, and you know, it wasn't even one of the bigger matches. It was one of the mid card, lower card matches. <laughs> you know, and they try to create a storyline out of it, and I don't know why. Of all the matches on this show, this was the one that. I don't even know of them having heat. Like, why did Jason Hodge attack him? But of all the matches for them to do an angle with, this is what they they went with. So, cool. Uh, Moose took on Rhino. I'm always interested in Moose. And I was, I'm never interested in Rhino. I'm, I'm just not. And this match lasts like two minutes. Moose wins on disqualification. I was like, cool, because I don't want to watch this match. And then they... Rhino gets on the mic and says he wants a street fight. And Santino has made it official. And if Moose leaves, he's going to lose his title shot at Hard to Kill. So we got a just unnecessary street fight. There's a, there's like a 10% chance that you're going to tell me, hey, there, these two people are wrestling in a street fight. And at, at the end of it, I'm like, yo, that was awesome. Or that I'm going to look forward to it at all. I just, I'm so over it. Um, yeah, at least call it something different. 
at least when you're just like, hey, this match is no DQ. At least it's not. It, it just, it just the term street fight. I'm so over it. But anyway, um, Moose versus Mino, Rhino. Obviously, Moose is going to win. They both have the same fucking finisher because everyone has spears on this show. Uh, Trinity and Jordan Grace versus Deanna Prazo and Giselle Shaw. This was actually a little, a little sloppy. Um, I give props to Deanna Perrazzo for really committing to her character to the very end. There's no boo-boo job face. There's nothing. And they're, I mean, they're beating her and beating her and beating her. And I've had the, the conversation when people say, well, she's on her way out the door. Like, did AEW do this to Jade Cargo when she was on her way out the door? I mean, does it mean it, it, it devalues everything that you did as a knockouts champion? everything you did for the knockout division, and it kills your opportunity to come back or resign. There's the dogs. Maybe she does resign. She just wants to test free agency. Maybe there's nothing out there for her. Maybe she doesn't like, maybe, you know, maybe she comes back. But can she after just getting beat like this? So the match was a little sloppy. I knew that um, Deanna and Giselle were going to win because they don't beat anybody. And I mean, Nobody. I I think I have a win versus one of them this this calendar year. This is the and, and at least they acknowledged it with Trinity, like she said something about it backstage. But this is the formula for Trinity. It's the formula for the knockouts champion. Let's have them on the same side. See if they can coexist. They do this every single time. I am. Telling you people, I am confident that Jordan Grace is turning on her because they are playing up everything. You know, everything Trinity is always wrestling her friends. There's always handshakes. There's always hugs. You know, Jordan Grace shaking hands with Bully Ray, who's supposed to be a bad guy. And, you know, they're taking little shots at each other. But you just, like a Give me a second, folks. I'm going to hit pause on this. Tell these motherfuckers to shut up. And uh, the problem is they stay in the house and kennels when they're not outside. And when the cats walk in front of them, they get mad. Boom, I'm back. I have returned. I let the dogs out. It's a little cold out this morning, but uh, I'm going to wrap up here soon. So they'll be okay for a bit. Anyway, um, let me pull everything back. I don't remember exactly, exactly what I was saying, but just basically it's been the same formula they've been beating this to death baby face versus baby face you have to create some intrigue going into the new year a lot of the times heels can do that especially heels that may not appear very beatable jordan grace is turning on her if i if i know anything scott scott the cuck is not going to beat trinity clean in her first loss she is not going to I mean, she, he is not going to, he is not going to, he is not going to. This is not going to end with Grace Driver, one, two, three, and, and Trinity does and kick out. Like, Jonathan Gresham's going to get involved or something. I'm telling you, this is not going to end baby facers, baby face, and a hug and a handshake. They're going to build some kind of feud out, out of this because what the hell back again after having to break up the damn Royal Rumble with the Cats. Anyway, Scott De had said is not beating Trinity clean. He's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. So overall, I thought the match was a little sloppy. The um, Man, the finish was straight up slop. Oh my god. Grace tries to roll up. Grace. Jordan Grace tries to roll up Deanna. Jackknife style after Trinity hit that power bomb fucking shit that she does. Which uh, Bully Ray also does because everyone has the same finishers on this show. Anyway. Oh, man. She goes for this jackknife. Completely misses. Um, tries to hook the legs. Can't. And Deanna, Deanna still takes the loss. And then after the match, Giselle lays Deanna out after they're trying to do a handshake. I, I think that's last Jen, uh, Deanna's last match with the company. I don't even think she, you know, I mean, they just straight, 
it's not like she's going to wrestle to Giselle, Giselle Shaw now, someone who needs a damn win. So I don't know, man. I I, I was I wasn't into that from start to, to finish at all. And then the main event was Motor City Machine Guns versus Zack Sabre Jr. and Josh Alexander. And I I enjoy watching Sabre because that's his name. I'm surprised he didn't call him Junior, actually. Pam the Pan up in, but uh, I I enjoy watching Zack Sabre Jr. wrestle. I don't get to watch him a whole lot because he doesn't really wrestle in places like I care about, but he has, you know, he has a very different style of wrestling. There's not many like him. And I enjoy anyone that's just different than everybody else, except PCO. But when you're just different than everybody else, like I, I can enjoy that style of wrestling. And I think for the majority of this match, I was like, fuck, this is a really good match, you know? And then after a while, I was like, this match won't end. And I, I, I feel like they lost the momentum a few times in the match because when you're, if the, if you're building a crescendo, you know, first it's a little bit of chain wrestling and stuff, and then you're like really building to a, you know, a climax at the end, the crowd is just, the crowd's going to be really, really into it. But it was like, there were several times where it just got quiet. And then you hear some kid walking, weapon. you know, when you start doing chants like that towards the end of the match, those are like when there's a dead point or a slow point, that's you start cheering. But it was just kind of going high and then it was kind of going low, kind of high, going low. And I was just like, this match is, how is this match going to end? I was like, this isn't going to end. This just keeps going. Like they're, they're going to fight forever. I think, you know, I, I felt like I was going to go to sleep and, and wake up in the morning. They were still going to be wrestling. So I thought it was the theme of the song. I mean, of the, of the song the theme of the night that a lot of the matches went too long, but th- this one really did for me. Um, it really went from, I'm like, well, this is one of the best tag team matches in the history of Impact to just, okay, somebody win, you know? And the problem I have with really long matches is like in a, like a match like this, did we care who won? You know, I can, I can be okay with a long match. If like, let, let's just, I'm just pulling this out of my ass. Moose versus Rich Swan. Both titles on a line. One of them is going to wrestle Kenny Omega. This was a couple of years ago. I can watch that be a 30-minute match because there's so much on the line, and you also don't quite know who's going to win. With this match here, do we care who wins? I don't think we knew who was going to – no, I'm not going to say that. Josh Alexander, after taking a couple of losses, like we knew his side was going to win. They weren't going to have Jack, Zack Sabre Jr. lose. You know, Obviously, you've got – but then you have two champions on the other team. So it's like a really tough match to book. But but it was no, it was definitely a lot of fun, but um just went on too long for something that I didn't ultimately care who won. You know, but uh, but no, everything everything looked good though. Um I would imagine Zach Saber Jr. and Josh Alexander are gonna face each other at Hard to Kill. Because what else is Josh gonna do? What better way in 2024 than to have Josh beat Zack Sabre Jr. and then the next night beat Will Ospreay? If you're talking about how do we get this guy hot in 2024, what better way? You know, so hopefully that's what they what they do. Um, Zack Sabre Jr. might even be the international superstar. I think it's Kenta. I hope I I, I want Kenta there, so I I do kind of hope it's him, but. Um, that's where I think they're going with it. I think they're going to announce here pretty soon Josh versus Zack Sabre Jr. I just I, I would be shocked if that's weren't um, more with the, where they go, they were going to go with it. So it was the last Impact event of the year, and uh, I mean I guess there's still a couple episodes or whatever that they're going to wrap the year up with, whether it's best of or whatever. But we're very we're getting very close to TNA time. And everyone's very excited about it. Um, they cannot miss. They cannot miss on this. They have to hit on all cylinders. They hit. They they where the the matches, the branding, the the look, the feel, the sound, the music, everything has to hit. They cannot. They cannot do an episode and then BQ sitting here after. Oh man, the lighting and the the fucking color. Like this cannot happen. 
in 2024. They have to hit. They have an opportunity. And I'm going to do uh, another podcast about this before TNA comes. They have an opportunity to be the alternative. They may never have this opportunity again. AEW is no longer the alternative. It is a knockoff of WWE. This is their opportunity. And how crazy would it be for a company that was known for trying to be a knockoff of WWE in their time, which ultimately uh, was their demise, to be the alternative 20 years later that they were promising to be the first time around? You know, I hope that's what happens. Um, but yeah, decent show with final resolution. Matches a little bit long. I think we're getting Josh versus Jack, Zack Sabre Jr. I hope that's where they go with it. Um, if not, we'll see. But they got to get something going for Hard to Kill here sooner than later. I'm your boy, BQ. Thanks for checking me.